Hello, everybody. It's Thursday, June 20th, 2024. Chapo starts now. And on today's episode, Felix and I uh, will be continuing uh, our sort of semi, semi-official semi series that uh, I suppose began a couple of weeks ago with uh, DJ Burns of The Rooster, where we are uh, taking some time to look at the states, look or rather look at um, some of the states that aren't New York and California, you know, the lesser states, the ones that people often forget or that I don't know about or have never been to. And today, of course, we are joined by Devin O'Shea to talk about the great state of Missouri. We will be talking about her political race there. We will be talking about all the weird shit that they're get up to with their veiled profits and then but also the McDonnell Douglas um, Aerospace Corporation. So there's a lot to get into with Missouri. Devin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, boys. All right, uh, uh, Devin, I, I don't mean to hijack the show. Right off the jump, but I got to get to this right off the top. It is not Missouri related, but I just got to say it's been on my mind all day. So I'll sure. just take, to take this time at the top of the show to just simply say, rest in peace, Donald Sutherland. All right, Donald the, Sutherland. The King. What a fucking great actor. What, I mean, just what, what, what a presence, a guy whose work I've always loved and who is uh, part of the Chapo canon because obviously his appearance as Mr. X in Oliver Stone's JFK. We did an episode about mm. that, but also much more recently, he was in Lawman Bass Reeves, which I just looked up is his last present credit on IMDb. So Damn. I would like to extend my condolences to Kiefer and the rest of the Sutherland family on what a just a, a, a legendary career. I mean, like this guy. His stretch of movies from like the late sixties to the early eighties is just unfucking touchable. You know, you got Dirty Dozen, Kelly's Heroes, Mash, Clute, Don't Look Now, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, goes on and on. And and Felix, how about this one? Are you a fan of uh, this movie, Citizen X, the HBO movie about the Soviet serial killer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the movie about uh, Andre Chiga uh, uh, Chuglug Chitelko. <laughs> One of those Ukrainian names. We don't really have to worry about it. But um, Donald Sutherland, I didn't know this could naturally happen. Donald Sutherland, he um, played an evil judge in Mm. every movie ever made. Hmm. Any type of period (laughs) piece, whether it was Lawman Bass Reeves or um, Tall Tales with Picos Bill, whatever the fuck that movie was called. That type of movie. You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. He would always play like a quasi amoral judge who was like, well, if you, the protagonist of the movie, want to go kill 87 people, you can be my guest. But I'm a, I'm also I'm going to have a handshake deal with another guy. Mm. That's the type of role he played. He will be greatly missed. He's one of those guys that seems like he was 87 years old for the last 48 years. <laughs> so I'm not really sure how this happened. This is another Biden bung up. Right. He's a white fox, you know, silver fox for a long time. That'll do it. Well, yeah, I mean, like, I, I guess if you're our age, like, like the, the, the movies you saw that came out, like when we were kids, like Donald Sutherland, he had transitioned from being the leading man that like i said he was in the 70s but he was just so comfortably fit into like the character actor part of like white hair and was always playing a heavy always playing a bad guy or just someone when they show up mm-hmm. in the movie you're like oh okay all right she just got real donald sutherland's there i'd also like to give a special shout out to the first movie that i remember watching him in animal house where he played a mm. lecherous pot smoking English professor who has sex with Karen Allen, uh, Peter Rieger's <laughs> girlfriend. So there's a lot of inspiration there. A lot, like really, really so many formative moments in my life. I, I you know, I, I can, I can trace or I can sort of like as a constellation, I can just point to Donald Sutherland as a star in the night sky of my memories and life. Uh, oh yeah. And also a little known fact about Donald Sutherland. He was with Jane Fonda, on her trip to North Vietnam, where she uh, hung out on the anti-aircraft batteries and sung songs and entertained the people. So I'd like to give Donald Sutherland credit for that as well. Damn, pouring one out. RIP to a legend, one of the great ones. He will be forever missed. Moving on from my uh, personal eccentricities, let's, uh, Devin, let's talk about Missouri. Let's get down to it. Yeah, I'll, I'll sort of begin with like a, a similar question that I asked uh, DJ Burns about Ohio. And that is... I feel like I, 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 Missouri is one of like the dozen or so states that I've never even set foot inside. So let me mm. ask you, like, 
what would you say to like someone not from the state? Like, how would you describe the Missouri character? Or like, like, is there a certain Missouri personality type? Like, how would you define this state to people uh, who are unfamiliar with it? Mm, that's a tough one. Uh, I would definitely say that like Missouri, like a lot of red states, is hugely different between Kansas City and St. Louis and everywhere else. Right? It's like totally gerrymandered to shit. But one of the weird things about Missouri is just that like St. Louis is like a city that's older than the United States and has all this French weird aristocratic baggage and then was Spanish briefly and then was like a sort of the last vestige uh, or the last like city that had legal slavery within the South. Right. And so it made everything in Missouri very evil and then, like, you know, Kansas then became freedom, you know, uh, Canada going up the river rather than being sold down the river. And I think that just affected everyone and that there's a lot of haunted, like, evil shit here. That's how I would describe it. <laughs> the, the gateway to the West, uh, the gateway to Yog Shagath, you might say. Exactly. Is the gateway a Freemasonry project to open a portal to hell? <laughs> like, it was... <laughs> It was created by Arrow Sorensen, and he was in the OSS. So, can't trust this Finnish architecture. Here's a big question: Is Missouri does it count as the Midwest or the South? I think it's the perfect center contradiction, and that makes it part of the Midwest. But it is like the northwest outpost of the South. It's very strange. I'm, I'm going to have to uh, interject here uh, as a orthodox Midwesterner. If you had slavery, <laughs> you are not in the Midwest. Well, <laughs> fair. Well, that's the weird thing is like in the cities, no slavery as soon as the war starts. And then I don't know. It's a lot of contradictions at the center point of East and West center point of North and South. It's also like the terminus point for all South American trade during the 1800s. So it's like the Northwest Caribbean also. Very weird. A lot of conflicting shit going on. And speaking of conflicting, confusing things, how the fuck did Missouri get away with having Kansas City in their state and not Kansas? Why is Kansas City in Missouri? Uh, I have no idea. I think uh, it has something to do with um, evil sort of like land barons in the seventeen late 1700s to early 1800s. But yeah, there's like a line directly through Kansas City and in St. Louis, like people don't really understand that the river also runs right through St. Louis. And there's a giant industrial sector in East St. Louis with a huge, like very rich and interesting history, part of which we'll see today because it's horrifying. But uh, yeah, the, both of the cities are like bisected by like dividing lines. So they're also like disempowered. It's weird. Well, I guess to uh, talk a little bit about the contemporary politics of Missouri, there is currently a congressional race in Missouri that is uh, getting some national profile, and it is very much a mirror of the Jamal Bowman, George Latimer congressional race that's going on here in New York, which is currently, I think, the most expensive congressional race in U.S. history, mm -hmm. the amount of money being poured in to George Latimer's campaign. But uh, in, in Missouri, we have... Uh, uh, Corey Bush, who's sort of like a, a marquee member of the squad, is right. uh, facing a challenge from a guy named Wesley Bell. Uh, what, what, what can you tell us about, like, about Wesley Bell and the contours of this, uh, th this congressional race or pr primary race between the two of them? Yeah, I think it is a lot. Uh, it's a weird mirror of the Bowman race. But Corey Bush is this seat, the Missouri 01, is most of North St. Louis, all of St. Louis city. And then there's a little flange on the bottom that incorporates Webster and it is majority African American, but it also encompasses like the richest part of St. Louis except for the County. And like it is primaried so that it is like the democratic bastion in the middle of Missouri. Everything around us is completely like every other race is completely fucked. There's no, challenge all the primaries are being decided between republicans like you guys talked about gomez the other week she's uh oh, yeah. running for state secretary and had the like flamethrower on the lgbtq books and then was running around downtown st louis in a bulletproof vest i don't know she's 
she's not running against a Democrat. She's just running against other Republicans in the state. So it's a weird map. But the other weird thing about this is that Bell and Bush both got their start during Ferguson in 2014. And Bell, like, there's a picture of Bell in, like, giving a speech during Ferguson, and, like, Cori Bush is literally in the background. So they both have these, like, bona fides from being on the street. But I went to a lot of those protests, and Cori Bush was definitely on the street and, like, leading protests more than, I would say, Wesley Bell was. Well, Wesley Bell, like you said, they both emerged out of Ferguson, but Wesley Bell became a prosecutor. It was like one of the first or, or the first black prosecutor uh, in, elected in St. Louis. Right. Which, I mean, in St. Louis County, especially, is like that's where the city is much more democratic uh, and the county is like the Republican bastion, just like all these Midwestern cities. And Bell becomes like county prosecutor and fails to convict Derek Chauvin, right? of uh, killing Michael Brown. So it's like he gets into office and one of the first things that he's supposed to be able to do with this big mandate is like actually bring justice to the situation, to the protests. And it was like the first sign, red flag, basically. And now, I, at least on the Bell side, like similar to the Latimer thing, uh, it, it, it's very clearly like that, that especially in the, in, in the current moment, uh, post October 7th, that like APEC is going all in on getting rid of any member of the squad and it oh, looks yeah. like they're going to be successful for bowman and but like what does it look like for wes for bell and bush now yeah i had the uh beautiful experience of writing for st louis magazine and talking to one of the older pollster guys at one of the universities and this dude was telling me about you know, the gossip that's going on at the Ritz Carlton Cigar Club, uh, which I guess you have to be a part of <laughs> in order to get things done around here. Um, OK, but... you know, I, the, the Ritz Carlton <laughs> Cigar Club. Yeah, now, does, this is this is unlike the veiled prophet, <laughs> the veiled prophets <laughs> or actually I know like the veiled prophet. It, they do indeed have a veiled prophet. The Ritz Carlton Cigar Club. This is a cigar club at the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Like what, that's exactly, what, 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 it's exactly uh, how it yeah, just guys. It's guys who go to go to the Ritz Carlton to smoke cigars to be stinky. Yeah, let's let's stink up a room, and uh, <laughs> apparently that's where the wheeling and dealing gets done. I would bet that there's a huge overlap between the cigar club and the Veiled Prophets. But as it, I mean, surprisingly, the guys in the cigar club do not like Corey Bush. Right? <laughs> These are guys that own like 26 McDonald's franchises. Okay, they're big shots. Will they? <laughs> These are also like executives in uh, the military industrial complex here, which is extensive. And they are pretty pissed that Cory Bush is so anti-war and taking such a hard line against the war in Israel. Uh, Wesley Bell has currently raised about, at last count, $869,000 from APAC, uh, which puts him in the top four recipients alongside George Latimer, Jackie Rosen, and of course, New Jersey's Bob Menendez. So I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, do you, I mean, the, this money, uh, this money really works. Uh, it spends, and like, but do, do you think that they will be successful in knocking off Cory Bush? Well, ninety-three uh, percent of incumbent Congress people just go right back to Congress. So she's got a huge amount of momentum, and then she's also got like, you know, the demographics in St. Louis. Like I mentioned, North St. Louis is a huge population of African Americans who are impoverished and have been systematically impoverished by the Veiled Prophet Society and the machinations of the city. And um, they, Cori Bush is their candidate. She's very popular amongst people who are living paycheck to paycheck. And she's unpopular with people who are financially doing great in this uh, fucked up economy. Because of the of the money injected into this race and because of Cory Bush's sort of national profile as a member of the squad in this race, of course, there are like we're, we're getting we're getting some uh, some Cory Bush scandals or like uh, <laughs> some, some things that her opponents are, are going to try to going to try to nail her nail her with. And the first the first of which I think is. A, 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 a sort of a, a really like kind of a nice scandal that you mentioned would be like the perfect basis for like a DC what politics based romantic comedy. And that is <laughs> that apparently uh, so back in January, uh, Republicans opened a DOJ investigation against Cory Bush for marrying one of her bodyguards and then keeping him <laughs> on the staff. And I 
yeah. which is like, I, I mean, I don't know, like ethically speaking, if that's totally above board. But look, love is love. How? Why would that be like ethically bad? Like he's supposed he's supposed to fucking protect her. That's not yeah. a conflict of interest. Like if he's married to her, oh, he he hates being told to. Uh, I don't know, change the swippers. I don't know what married people do. <laughs> uh, so I assume they have arguments. About that's a that's oh, what you goes didn't on change the swiffer. Yeah. You're gonna kill the baby. <laughs> oh, you know you. Oh, you didn't tape. Uh, how I met your mother too. I'm Damn. going to kill you. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's going to protect her one way or the other. I don't see how that's like a, an ethical thing. Well, okay. Now it says your congressional ethics rules uh, maintain that representatives can uh, allow family members to be paid from campaign funds for what it, quote unquote bona fide services. So long as the payments do not exceed quote fair market value. And now Bush, in her defense, says she did retain uh, her husband as part of her security team, but claims that he has been able to provide services at below market rate, which is like, you know, <laughs> is, is it uh, thrifty and effective? I mean, she's saving the taxpayers money here because, yeah, you can pay your husband less. Yeah, I, it's also I mean, I can't help but think it's like Marjorie Taylor Greene marries one of her like big, strong guys with a gun like that's. That's huge. That's great. Oh, my God. We're so happy in love. But, you know, when Cori Bush does it, oh, no, that's bad. Well, is he like, um, like is, a, is he like a, a normal bodyguard or is he like, um, you know, the kind of bodyguard I like uh, <laughs> a liar? You know, one of those guys who's like, um, I used to be an assassin and that's why I make thirty eight thousand dollars a year as a bodyguard. now. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Honestly, I think I mean. He has to be effective because also Cory Bush has legitimately been shot at like while <laughs> during Ferguson and like while campaigning. So he, if he, so he's probably not a liar. I would hope not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's not as fun for me, but it's good for her. <laughs> I mean, wait, Devin, Devin, you, you, you say that and I, I was totally unaware of this. Uh, that a sitting congressman has been shot at multiple times. Yeah, there's like a uh, she was giving a speech. I can't remember exactly when this was, but her like car got hit by gunfire and she was, I think, in the north side. And that's not necessarily this is a bad thing about St. Louis. OK, and I love this place and it's beautiful. And I, I love all the people who live here. There's a lot of gunfire. Also, it just happens. But yeah, she's been shot at. She's had death threats. I mean, during Ferguson, remember, like the St. Louis County was flooded, not only with cops and militarized police, but these fucking three percenter guys would show up and stand on the roof of the auto zone with like fully loaded, you know, Kyle Rittenhouse outfits and stuff. Luckily, nothing. Well, also, yeah. Speaking of uh, speaking of Ferguson, let's also not forget that many of the leaders of the like uh, the Ferguson protest movement or several of them were uh, all found um, shot in the head in cars that were completely burned. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. They, yeah. they committed just suicide like a... in their car, and then the car was um, consumed by flames, which conveniently destroyed all forensic evidence. Well, that typically happens when someone's really depressed. <laughs> their car yeah. just catches on fire. When I'm feeling really down, I've tried to put the muzzle right up to the back of my head, you know, because I want to like, sort of fly <laughs> forward into heaven. <laughs> now, there, there, there's the fact that I mean, honestly, yeah, her husband's a bodyguard. This is the bodyguard. You could do a remake with uh, like the Kevin Costner, Whitney Houston. I think that's charming. But my favorite of the Cory Bush scandals, or I, I say scandals in quotation marks, but. Uh, the one that came out this week, I saw the New York Post was pushing this very hard. Uh, yeah. In regards, Cor Corey's claims that she has healed people through sort of faith healing. She has cured, uh, claimed, this, uh, claimed that she had said that she had healed someone's cancer through a kind right. of spiritual or faith healing. And like to which I say, do you believe in Christianity or not? <laughs> right. You know, right. like, do, do you believe in God or not? Because, you know, like if you do, like you'd have to at least open yourself to the possibility like, hey, maybe, maybe she did spiritually heal somebody. Maybe she did. Maybe did she lay hands on someone? But I think it was the New York Post reporter. I forget who it is. But he was like, can you imagine if Marjorie Taylor Greene said something this crazy? And it was like, well, yes, I can. But it seems like she uh, does all the time. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, another thing to stress is that like a big difference between most politicians and Cori Bush is that she was legitimately a regular person, like only whatever, uh, 10 years ago. So like she's a regular person from North St. Louis who was a nurse here. Right, right. Well, the, right. That's the thing about her, like healing things is like most people who said, oh, I healed someone. They're just, um, you know, often like uh, just a, a preacher, no special abilities. But this is a nurse saying it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe there's miscommunication here. I don't know. But like she could easily what I'm saying is she has a faith and dexterity belt. Exactly. Yes. She can do yes, one or the exactly. other. Exactly. Every group <laughs> needs a cleric, you know. I think that's a Don Hughes tweet that I stole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Friend of the show, Don. <laughs> yes, <shout out>. yes. <laughs> the double standards discussing. And like I said, because she's the squad and because they've all been, you know, marched for death by APAC, you know, the idea that a, a, a congressperson from anywhere in this country, the idea that they're like, I feel like half of them <laughs> have laid claim <laughs> to the ability to heal tumors through prayer. So, I mean, this, right. is just, this is just normal American politics stuff. And it feels right. The fact that she's a nurse, look, faith and spiritual healing could be part of a holistic package that also includes chemotherapy. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly hearing doctors say that, you know, faith practices are an important part of a recovery or your potential to overcome a deadly illness. But I mean, is this is this catching on in St. Louis, in Missouri? Do people care? Uh, I don't think anybody who is voting in St. Louis, if anything, like the faith healing story is kind of like sweet. I mean, the people who are really getting jazzed about this are on Twitter and they're like already not voting for Cori Bush. But like on the ground in St. Louis, I think there is a perception that like Cori Bush is in there actually doing stuff for regular people. The amount of like social spending that's come back to St. Louis is like better than usual. There's a, uh, I wrote for the nation about, we had like terrible catastrophic flooding here like two years ago, probably the last of it, but it ruined a bunch of the infrastructure for light rail that sucks in St. Louis. So it destroyed a system that already sucks. And Cori Bush got a ton of money extracted from the Biden administration to not only replace all this Metrolink infrastructure, but like to have a plan going forward for increased funding. Uh, she's got like the Green New Deal for City stuff and all that. Um, well, actually, speaking of uh, like an environmental concerns in uh, St. Louis and Missouri, could you talk a little bit about her work with a group called Just Moms St. Louis um, yeah. and dealing with, with something called the Cold Water Creek? What What is Coldwater Creek and why is this an important environmental issue for St. Louis and Missouri? Yeah, this is going to make me sound totally deranged. And I'm sorry that we're talking about all the craziest shit in the city. But in downtown St. Louis, during the Manhattan Project, Mellencroft Chemical was straight up refining uranium in a intensely populated area out of an old stove factory. No, that, that <laughs> sounds pretty much like <laughs> what like everyone did. Until like <laughs> 2003. Yeah. That's, yeah, that doesn't really sound crazy. That sounds exactly like what we would do, more it's, or less. It was like such a cavalier. I mean, this isn't, they had problems with flooding in the facility. And then, like, people, even a couple years after they had started, were like, <laughs> They didn't preheat the stove. They didn't preheat the <laughs> ovens before putting the uranium in. Right. <laughs> they were just barehanding it into a stove and being like, oh, man, that guy's hand fell off. And That's then it's unlucky. done and they try to get it out and they don't have an <laughs> oven mitt. They're like, ah, ha, 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 ha. Oh, damn. Yeah. So <laughs> unfortunately, it only gets like a million times worse from there because they depleted all this depleted uranium is Malincrot's responsibility to get rid of. And they drive it up to where the airport is going to be and they stick it in a hole with a bunch of barrels. And the hole is not that far away from Coldwater Creek. And so it's just like the Simpsons era of like nuclear yeah. <laughs> anxiety. Um, <laughs> it comes true. So Coldwater Creek poisons people for literally like half of a century. Like we're talking about a monumental amount of evil, like. Nobody even had signposts around the creek until like nineteen, the late nineteen nineties, <laughs> where people. Uh, yeah, it was like Jesus. it was the swimming creek. Right. There, were, there was no weird hostile architecture that was like this is not a place of honor. There is, <laughs> there is no leave now. Yeah, this is no. Just, there was so. 
an elementary like, yeah, school abutted it. So yeah. mm. all those bald children are arousing suspicion. That is how they figured it out. Is there a giant <laughs> leukemia cluster in a high school class and they had a reunion oh God. and we're like, oh shit, all of us are dead. It's extremely evil. Now the other, you know, disgusting pervert who is sniffing around this catastrophe is Josh Hawley. And Josh Hawley's spin on this whole thing is like, damn, look at what the government did to our uh, you know, natural spring water. So both <laughs> So wait, so like so so he's he's saying like, oh, this is a big government poisoning people, but like you said, it is uh exactly. he, he's not mentioning the uh the the Mallincroft Chemical Corporation. No. Uh so like so so just mom St. Louis and the work of Corey Bush, like what 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 are they trying to organize around? Are they trying to get uh like a civil action against the, the Mallincroft Chemical Corporation? They get they're trying to get the state or like someone to just pay for what? Like the the thousands of cases of cancer that it caused, like or the a cleanup, <laughs> like what what is the ask here? Unfortunately, like living in this city has made me an expert on like uh, cleaning up industrial poisoning, but. Like what you have to do is dig up the creek because all of that stuff will sit there forever in the fucking mud. And so you have to trudge the whole creek and take all that dirt and put it somewhere else away from people and cap it. Basically put a tarp down and then cap it. And that's going to cost like four hundred million dollars. Uh, and so Just Moms is like the local grassroots organizing effort around this. So, so the equivalent of one peer in Gaza. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if we could have just not done the peer and done this instead, <laughs> it would have made everyone a lot happier. Um, there's so much to this. Also, there's a good documentary called Atomic Home Front on this. But like a lot of the other debris that they did dig up out of Coldwater Creek then got put in a landfill called the West Lake Landfill. And that's a landfill in North St. Louis where one half of it is all this depleted uranium. And then the other half of it is a smoldering garbage fire that all officials say, don't worry, everything's under control. Okay, so so St. Louis is basically Springfield. This is is what you're saying here. This is is the most Springfield like American city uh, that we have. (laughs) And like, well, you mentioned like the sort of like the the, the, the divisions in St. Louis and like the division between St. Louis and East St. Louis. And basically, like, which is the division between white and black in St. Louis. And like, surprise, surprise, like most of the areas that they choose to dump uh, industrial waste seems to be in the heavily black parts of St. Louis. And like, uh, it's sort of like, environmental racism you know i think that's like a term it gets around people roll their eyes at but it really is true no it's a it's like yeah yeah i don't know how that got turned into like people lump that in with like white fragility shit and it's like no that's like one of the ones that's like actually happened where they just like hey here there's a chemical that just makes your eyes fall out (laughs) what's the blackest place we can put it (laughs) like it's it's not like some intangible thing it's like you know one of the most demonstrably has happened things ever yeah it's it's part and parcel of like st louis it creates non-stop beautiful metaphors for the like satanic underpinnings of the country (laughs) and like (laughs) It's just a it's a cavalcade of this symbolic mishmash. And it all has to do with the fact that like a long time ago, there is a specific kind of racism that infected the elites in St. Louis and that like they literally drew the maps to liquidate and demolish the black community here. And part of that, just one small branch is like, oh, we're just going to dump all that Manhattan Project shit out there. Yeah. No, it, it, it was um, Cardinals fandom before baseball. <laughs> that's what that's called. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, Devin, thank you for, uh, for, for setting me up with the perfect segue. Because, Absolutely. You, know, you mentioned, what are the symbolic representations of the satanic evil at the heart of the American empire? You'd be hard pressed <laughs> to find a better symbolic representation then vp vp for vice president well in Mm. this case yes but in fact we're also talking about the veiled prophet the veiled prophet ball uh whatever this thing is and like this came into people's consciousness because of the revelation that uh ellie kemper of you know the unbreakable kimmy schmidt and other comedies was (laughs) 
<laughs> a, a veiled prophetess. But could you just give us like a refresher on the kind of like Carcosa, like semi-secret <laughs> society that is a very a very distinct Missouri thing? Like who who are these veiled prophets, and what do they do? What are they <laughs> prophesized? <laughs> what are they predicting? Well, well, it's so hard to like say it quick, but in general, it's like the Veiled Prophet is a mascot for a men's club, right? <laughs> and it emanates, this is a men's club that goes back to the 1870s. And uh, Ellie Kemper, you know, the headline was um, she was crowned queen of the KKK ball, right? And that like, uh, that was in 1999 that that had happened. And it just suddenly surfaced during the pandemic. I don't know. But that was most people's engagement with it. And it's like really bizarre to just like look at the guy and look at the the girls that are like bowing in front of him. They have a ball every year that's called the Veiled Prophet Ball. And all of the richest young women in St. Louis are they are presented to society in this debutante ball and they have to like go up and bow before the prophet. And then one of them is crowned his queen of love and beauty. So that's what Ellie Camper is. But there's also always been this like public party aspect, a parade and like a seasonal fair. Don't you, don't you think it's kind of weird how like she was in this Carcosa ceremony that was, um, you know, it's not uh, fucking Bohemian Grove level, you know, let's be clear here. But yeah. it's, ev- you know, it's pretty like evil. It's pretty like um, they could get a lot done is what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that like, imagine you were like crowned queen of the Illuminati, the underworld, the Bohemian Grove. And then like you were in the fifth Home Alone movie. <laughs> like, I know she had successes <laughs> after that, but it just kind of like. Yeah, that wouldn't happen to the real Illuminati. No, <laughs> they would like they would get you in a better movie. <laughs> yeah, the Veiled Prophets are a perfect metaphor, also because like they are like everybody has to treat us like we are really secretive and very powerful, and they are. They did put like a guy, one of their guys, in charge of the FBI and the CIA and Homeland Security. They've got connections in the State Department. They've got the local FBI office. They've got all these industries captured throughout, you know, the centuries. But then they also are like, but we also want to have like, this is a prestige brokerage and I want to be famous. And so they print all of their names and faces every year in the Ladue News edition. And like all of their family names are out there. The roster is basically out there. Um, that that is kind of the difference between like them and the trilateral commission like all the people all the people who control important things like emily in paris or like (laughs) the beekeeper like the good movies um, (laughs) and good shows um the opiates of the masses yeah there's just there's so much like small town chintziness to this where it's like oh "Oh, we're evil we're bad we worship moloch we're gonna we, we are the masters of the world Make sure you get us in the daily saver. <laughs> I want to I want to show my kids that I was in the newspaper. It's like you fucking rube. <laughs> no wonder well, you, know, you could only get her in the home alone movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like I think Felix, I think you may be right that like in the entertainment industry, yeah, you want to you want to get plugged up with the Illuminati. However, yeah. the veiled prophets have some heavy hitters there. And now uh, now uh, Devin, you mentioned that the, the first um there was a first sort of uh, dramatic an unveiling of who yeah. one of the veiled prophets was in 1972. Uh could you, could you tell who the first unveiled prophet who who they were and uh, what company they worked for and what famous product <laughs> they were working on at the time? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh this is also um there's a bigger deep dive when, with our True Non episode from a few years ago. Uh, but this is the big culmination of the Veiled Prophet story is in 72 after years of civil rights protesting, this big strategic effort to sort of like confront the problems of a segregated, impoverished St. Louis and the like just shitting the bed economic system that is like tearing apart the city. That conflict all comes down to Jenna Scott breaking into the Veiled Prophet ball going up to the balcony with her two protesters. They make a big scene. Jenna Scott grabs a cable and 
fucking Tarzan swings down onto the stage and fractures her <laughs> rib. She pops up. Wow, and says, just like John Wilkes Booth. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she is. She's she's ready. She pops up and says, I got to get a phone call. And so she like gets away from people and gets up the back of the stage and unveils the veiled prophet to reveal that it is Tom K. Smith, the vice president of Monsanto Corporation, basically at the height of Agent Orange production. It is like the the ape, the fever pitch of the Vietnam, just like genocidal uh, dream happening elsewhere. And then there's all these city elites who suddenly like are just looking at one of their buddies up on stage. Um, it's very bizarre. No picture of him unveiled exists. Why did he do that? <laughs> they were, they thought that they were going to be able to cinch it up. I think, I think, well, like, but well, yeah, but like, well, like what? Like you're already, you already like are the head of Monsanto during right. like, probably the most foundational period for Monsanto becoming like a major multinational company. Yeah. Uh, not just agent orange, but like this was sort of really the um, explosion of agribusiness as an international concern, at least in its modern form. Yeah. Why was he also like, Ooh, I, I also want to be the prettiest girl. in town. <laughs> I really, I also want to be the orientalist, like a uh, king from the land of Coruscant who flies on a magic carpet to visit St. Louis and bestow my prosperity amongst this river city population. I think that they really did the, the regionalism of the veiled prophets is also part of like how psychotic they've been able. Or There's a thing that I talk about in the book I'm writing about this where St. Louis is interesting historically because of the decline that sort of like preserved this very ancient elite structure of control in amber while the city fell apart, but was also juiced by defense department contracts and companies like Monsanto. And I think that they really were just tripped out on power. Like they didn't think that all the post-dispatch guys, editors who would have ran his picture are in the crowd and they're horrified. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's very bizarre. Um, it, it's not just Monsanto. Uh, I think I think that we should transition into a big interest of Felix: fighter jets. Fighter Absolutely. jets. Could you talk about okay the McDonnell Douglas Aerospace Corporation and their connections to the Ville Profits, but also the VP Fair? You mentioned that, and I think it is cool that a secret society just has a big party that's open to the public every year, and they call it. <laughs> The VP Fair, and it's sort of like a Fourth of July, like big. Everyone drinks beer and is outside and is hot as hell. But like, we'll get into some of the other weird stuff for the VP Fair. But like, could you talk a bit about how big and important McDonnell Douglas is to the state can, of I, Missouri? And I, I just sorry, some folks. background on on McDonnell Douglas oh, for please. people who are unaware. They have created, I would say, probably the two most important planes in the American uh, air power arsenal of the modern era since Vietnam. The F-15, which was uh, primarily, it started off as an air superiority fighter, probably the greatest one the world had ever seen, and then turned into the world's greatest strike fighter. Mm. The F-A-18, which was purposed to replace the incredibly costly F-14, uh, pr first invented to complement it and then replace it. But mm. uh, McDonnell Douglas was eventually acquired by Boeing, but these two designs were the fulcrum of their entire business uh, and the fulcrums of American air power. Incredibly vital, not just for us, but for our, uh, our closest allies. We have famously given Israel several iterations <laughs> of the F-15 for no money, nothing, at cost. Here you go. Goddamn. Uh, yeah. Just a little background on them. They are, they made the hits. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I wanted to get your reviews of their output. And, you know, obviously, F-15, F F F-16, I mean, yeah, they're the, they're the standard here. But none of them, I don't think either of those new ones have anything close to the charm of their original fighter jet, the F-4 Phantom. Right. Do you have any thoughts? That, do, you, do you have your review of the F-4 Phantom? Yeah. The F-4 Phantom is the greatest triumph of thrust over fucking gay bullshit like aerodynamics <laughs> <laughs> and lift. It was like, it was cool. It was like a flying brick. It somehow <laughs> went Mach 
like 2.5 or not 2.5 but like 2.2 in a clean configuration even though it's like one of the least mobile looking airplanes ever made it was it was a cool plane and it like um i don't know we sold a lot of them oh, yeah. iran iran and iraq we famously <laughs> sold them to both of those guys um <laughs> It was yeah no it it was it was an interesting plane um so one of the more annoying modules in DCS and that's really how I evaluate planes but mm. yeah no they the F four I guess was like you could technically call it like a swing roll fighter um but yeah yeah the description I heard of like how McDonnell Douglas got like tasked with designing it was like hey we invented a rocket like figure out how to yeah. put a guy on this. <laughs> and some bombs well, it's really amazing that like it was capable of like doing anything it's just <laughs> so unwieldy looking would you say that it was also like because of that sort of a metaphoric thing for nato of just like if you're part of the club we're gonna sell you our bricks with thrusters yeah i mean it's emblematic of a type of policy of nato which is just Push on ahead. Who cares? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no aerodynamics needed. Just thrust. Not necessary. Yeah. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, Devin. I was going to say, just return to uh, McDonnell Douglas, because you talk a little bit about, about like their importance in the history, like to the state of Missouri. And I think for a while, we're the state's biggest employer. And like Missouri right. as kind of like a nexus or like a hub of the military industrial complex. And then, of course, McDonnell Douglas's connection to the the veiled profit fair. <laughs> yeah. As we're saying, like basically in the sixties, defense department contracts start flooding into McDonnell Douglas and the Phantom is the big thing that just makes it a billion dollar company. And there's just huge expansions. This is basically a bunch of jet money that is already hitting a military industrial complex. That's been making gun turrets and dynamite at Monsanto and all kinds of insane stuff since the First World War, but really ramping up in the Second World War. So throughout the Cold War, McDonnell Douglas is like, just becomes this supercharged part of the Missouri economy. It's the number one employer. It's also got all these weird interconnections, not only with like one of the Douglas's daughters becoming Veiled Prophet Queen, Percy Green, who's like the central antagonist to the Veiled Prophet, the activist, um, he worked at McDonnell Douglas and successfully fought a Supreme Court case against them for discriminatory hiring practices. So there's like all these discriminatory weird discriminatory in what sense? In that, like, um, of these tens of thousands of employees hired at McDonnell Douglas in like the 70s, the entire janitorial staff is African American, and that's it. Uh, yeah. It's like wild discrimination, like uh, nightmarish, villainous discrimination. And that was this is also all just like historical echoes of other things that have happened in St. Louis history. But yeah, they are the hub until they get caught with uh, their hands in uh, the cookie jar in 1979. They get federal charges for the CEO, the oldest son of the company. Um, for selling to, you know, uh, countries you're not supposed to sell to, like South Korea, Pakistan, Venezuela, Zaire, when it existed in the Philippines. Did this overlap with the uh, infamous Tung Sung Park scandal? They're about the same timeline. Oh, is that the, the Airbus thing or is that a different thing? Tung Sung Park was, he was the reason that Carl Albert resigned as oh. um, Speaker of the House, among other people, but he was a sort of South Korean scam artist and like one quarter legitimate lobbyist. And he, he was able to steer a lot of defense contracts for South Korea oh. and increased appropriations towards Korea through bribery. But he also, he made an appearance like 20 years later during oil for food. Hmm. He never went away. <laughs> <laughs> He's still just bouncing around. Yeah. yeah I was going to ask you, Felix, if there's like a continuous, or if there's like a trend in other defense contractors for jets of like, well, we put the sun on the throne and then he like tried to sell bombs to somebody we're not supposed to. Well, if I'm not mistaken, that just seems to be a pattern with like every company <laughs> in, in this period that like, um, be it, you know, Cold War prosperity or just um, how things were that like you could you could run like a very 
you know, you can't fuck around at a defense contractor quite like you can at a dealership, but they'll sure let you run it the same way. Right. Some, yeah. My son's going to do Felix, this. Felix, I mean, this is what I'm thinking. Yeah, this is what I'm thinking. Like, like in my head, like where I'm just like, wait a second. Like, how do you even like, like sell military hardware to come to countries that are officially not, you're not supposed to sell them fighter jets. And I'm just thinking like <laughs> McDonald Douglas, like it is like, like a, like a, like a car lot. And they just got fighter jets. <laughs> you're driving on the highway. They got the big blow up man that's waving around and they're like come on in and it's like representatives of the venezuelan government walk into the lot and then like the the, the son of the ceo is just there and he's like hey look what do i got to do to put you in one of these f-16s let's make it happen <laughs> yeah. today <laughs> yeah it, it just like, like like jets in general and planes in general are like famously not very easy to hide Mm, right. <laughs> like among, uh, yeah. among among the most registered things in existence and mm-hmm. i just i like the idea that like you know it, all these things are registered you put ra- official roundels like official icons of your country's military on them <laughs> and just like what was go- what was the good outcome here what was his i what was his best case scenario that like they see these jets and he's like, I don't know where they found them. <laughs> I guess I, I'm so silly. I left them. I, I, I parked uh, 700 of these <laughs> in my driveway and I left the keys in the ignition. <laughs> I guess Venezuela came over and fucking stole them. <laughs> uh, I, I like the idea of uh, our, the current crap of uh, F-35 next gen fighters. And like any country we're trying to sell these to, we're upselling them on the true coat so it can fly when it rains. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, you're 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 a, you're a fucking liar. And it's like, well, I went. Hold on, let, me, let me let me let me let me talk to my boss, and they come back and it. Well, you know, he's never done this before, but he's gonna let you have that true code. And it, <laughs> all the all the F thirty five all the F thirty fives are not stealing the plane. It's just like Edgar's from all different countries and cultures <laughs> taking the catalytic converter, <laughs> leaving the rest of the plane. They don't want it. <laughs> Just the catalytic converter. Some valuable stuff in there. <laughs> uh, but uh, to return to the, uh, the 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 VP fair, and then yeah. the VP, the vice president. So, like, jumping ahead a little bit in the timeline here to 1988. Mm-hmm. And at the time, then vice president, who was vice president in 1988? That's right. It's our old friend, Poppy H.W. Bush. <laughs> he attends the VP fair. But interestingly, this was this was, like, sort of concurrent to a like you know like you said uh, William H. Webster director of the CIA who was a St. Louis guy and also a veiled prophet member at, like what is it like the sort of the, the 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 timeline congruence of like a major restructuring of McDonnell Douglas and George H.W. Bush's appearance at the veiled prophet fair yeah it's sort of mysterious uh, when you go back and look at I've got like all these promotional things from the VP fair and just like there's Poppy Bush, like just chowing down on a brat, and there's like a very intimidating Secret Service guy on his shoulder, and then there's just like this this very chubby like Midwestern guy being like, "Golly, Mister Bush, I'm sure I'm glad you came down to St. Louis." And like, <laughs> so Poppy shows up at a very like interesting year, eighty eight. There's a big restructuring happening at McDonnell Douglas because of a bunch of these problems, because the Phantom is not as profitable anymore. I'm not a huge aerospace uh, industry historian, but there was a big changeover at towards the end of the civil or the cold war where all of these aerospace or at least McDonnell Douglas was trying to get into like civilian jets. They wanted to do like a jumbo jet program basically with Taiwan. So they did this big restructuring at McDonnell Douglas and they shed basically 40% of the jobs in St. Louis, which is catastrophic. It's a huge meltdown in terms of like, how is the economy planned? Is it completely hooked up to phantom jets? What happens when the phantom jets get too old? Oh, there's no plan. Oh, shit. Everybody like get out of here. Also, there's a party down by the arch. That's what you get instead of employment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's going to be girls in bikinis and there's going to be Budweiser's. So get going. So yeah, Bush shows up during, it's like it's a weird moment in history because they, we had just shot down a passenger jet in Iran and killed 300 civilians. And Poppy is, gives comment under the arch in this star spangled, like, 
sort of neoliberal fever dream. And it's just like, well, sometimes things happen. And that's my best Poppy Bush also. <laughs> I mean, well, that guy, like, this, and it's 1988. Then in, by 1990, mm-hmm. Poppy Bush is now president of the United States. And then, interestingly, in 1990, uh, him and then then Missouri Senator uh, John Danforth, who was also a veiled prophet, Absolutely. announced that uh, they they announced that and Felix, you're gonna, you're gonna guess where this is going. What do they do to, to save the company? Well, they announced the sale of seventy two of seventy two F fifteen Eagle fighter planes. Do you guess that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, <laughs> a five billion dollar uh, deal that was just basically like like I said, like just just a payoff to the Saudis. <laughs> um well well this was this was actually a really interesting deal um john dolan uh aka the warner gary brecher has written extensively and talked extensively on his show about this exact type of practice which is very interesting and it is something that you can you can sort of trace back to the 80s but you know this was i would say the the biggest example of it thus far in history which is selling incredibly advanced systems to Saudi Arabia, like systems that we previously would not sell them, like the F-15, which was, again, you know, the premier air superior- superiority and uh, then later strike fighter, just unparalleled in the world. You know, an F-15E has never been shot down ever. Hmm. But um, sounds like a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and well, any you know, yeah. listeners out there we gotta, we gotta you, you can be a guest on the show if you shoot down an f-15 <laughs> yeah. that's how i got but, on but um <laughs> the previous doctrine of course was that you wouldn't sell something like this great to a military that really didn't know how to use them or <laughs> <laughs> really uh go to war or use their own soldiers or were really that good or anything because of course, like what happens when they lose? Right. Uh, someone, someone you don't know. Maybe, it'll, maybe they'll be a nice guy. Maybe not. They're gonna get all those F-15s. That's not nice. <laughs> what if you? What if you gave your friend? What if you gave your friend a jacuzzi and he died and his dumbest cousin got it? Oh. That's you're asking <laughs> to give the neighborhood chlamydia. <laughs> Everyone's gonna blame you. But anyway, the, the, this was this was not an accident. The real purpose of this policy was that selling them these incredibly expensive, incredibly advanced systems was in part, it was making up for, um, you know, all the oil we were buying and everything and how, how rich they became from fully owning a Ramco, but also it was an insurance policy on their part. If they ever faced internal uprising or military defeat, we would step in because we didn't want whoever beat them or whoever, was going to overthrow them to get a hold of these incredibly advanced systems mm. we were selling them. So it was like said, it, um it was the marker a, of a new era of policy. Mm. It's a payoff that goes in both directions, right? Because if like if the Saudis just paid the United States government directly like the billions of dollars the equivalent of like 72 F15 fighter jets just to be like as protection money, that would look bad. So like the the, the actual physical jets themselves are just sort of representatives of that bribe. That like, right. you know, like they can't directly <laughs> just give America money to just be like, hey, protect us always and, you know, prop up our evil, awful regime. No, we're going to we're going to buy wink, wink, all these fighter jets from you that we're totally going to use. And we totally have an air force that's capable of flying them and using well, them and not just well, sitting they, in a fucking parking lot. <laughs> well, well, like famously, you know, they have come. They like did eventually use these planes. Um <sighs> to terrible horrific you know war crime effects in Mm. yemen uh 25 years later but like an interesting thing did happen in these gulf countries not just saudi arabia but also the uae and to a lesser extent Qatar, uh where the role like a the role of being a fighter pilot which was there was a little bit of this in some uh, monarchies in the region, but it, it, it became much more pronounced after the sale of more advanced American systems that that became like the, the new cavalry. Mm. If you were nobility of any type, being a fighter pilot, you know, flying one of these new F-15s or whatever, you know, that was seen as a very like cool and desirable thing. Right. And that's, that was your place in the military as a high board. Mm. And of course, if, uh, 
you know, for infantry, uh, that's either impoverished conscripts or Colombians that we hire, mm. you know, mercenaries. But right. you as royalty or any other type of person of any type of importance, provided your eyesight's fine, you get to fly 35,000 feet above everyone else, you know, firing the most advanced standoff weapon systems and blowing up hospitals and uh, funerals. That's way better than a suit of armor and a horse. Yeah. But very related. I also cannot stress how mind-numbing it is that the Veiled Prophet is a guy from Iran. He is a Orientalist (laughs) mythological figure that is like the godhead of these general dynamics executives who are like bombing the Middle East and also worshiping Al-Mukana, the Veiled One. It's a really weird, just... Orientalism is like the weird unconscious of all of this. It's great. And then another connection is the Bush family. In 1991, Catherine Hall McDonald, the daughter of the CEO of McDonald Douglas, was, of course, crowned the Veiled Prophet Queen. And escorting her in attendance was Poppy Bush's younger brother, William (laughs) H.T. Bush, the the forgotten Bush, the forgotten Bush family member. But, you know, Mm. who knows? I mean, the guy's covered in a veil. Maybe Poppy himself was the prophet. We don't know. Nobody nobody unveiled him. They won't tell us. They are inviting scrutiny and they invite like us to like speculate about who the veiled prophet is. And like they keep the the roster close. You know, if you if you know what that roster is, I'm on signal. But uh, that's what I'm still looking for. But if it was a seating president, a sitting president, that would be like groundbreaking. And the whole thing is that the veiled prophet is a guy that is like the most important guy in the St. Louis economy that year. And I can't think of, you know, maybe there's some other rivals, but like you said, like in the, the year previously, uh, H.W. Bush as president sealed the deal for all those fucking fighter jets to Saudi Arabia. So, yeah, I'd say he's pretty important to the economy of St. Pretty Louis important. That year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, just like in the, t- in the time we have left, though, I, I want to turn to the, the, the VP fair, the veiled profit fair, which at a certain point was rebranded as just celebrate St. Louis because of all the uh, nefarious associations. But like, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you read about like one insane example back in like 87 of once again, how this is all just like a microcosm for like the satanic racism and segregation of uh, St. Louis proper. And you talk about how the organizers uh, got the St. Louis Police Department to close a major bridge on the day of the Veiled Prophet Fair to prevent, in their words, gang members from coming in to rob and <laughs> pillage the fair-going attendees. Yeah, this is another just beautiful little situation where the whole project that the City Fathers do in the 50s is to demolish half of the historic downtown that, oh no, the river boat economy collapsed, we got to blow everything up and build this giant parabola that's Masonic or whatever. And uh, we got to also push people downtown because it's hollowing out because of our own economic policies. So we're going to have the VP fair down there, but we only want white people to show up to it. And so this comes ahead, right? When they close the bridge to East St. Louis. And one of the big things to understand also about the veiled prophet as he's represented in St. Louis is that he is a strike breaker. He is a Klansman who originally is in St. Louis to shoot striking trolley workers and to fracture the working class in St. Louis along racial lines. And so when they close the bridge and the NAACP gets called in and a judge has to say, you have to open the bridge to East St. Louis. You can't shut you know, a big part of the city out of the fair a bunch of people are like, oh, what's the last time something racist happened on a bridge in St. Louis? Oh, shit. What about 1917 when there was an enormous, horrific pogrom in East St. Louis, basically because of World War I munitions plants that were incentivizing poor black uh, ex-sharecroppers up from the South to work in the factories. They overflowed East St. Louis, and it caused a huge race riot. That's what it's called on the Wikipedia page. But it was really a pogrom. It was the National Guard and the police and regular guys with guns shooting black people to evict them from East St. Louis and send them across the bridge where, you know, 
there's further chapters of how the city elites in St. Louis have treated the black community here that, but that's like one of the er sins. It's like something undealt with in our unconscious that makes progress almost impossible. It seems like, uh, just, just lastly here, I'm looking at some of the, the supplementary material you provided us. So it's just, uh, photos of the old <laughs> profit ball. And then yeah. like, I'm, I'm looking at one that is like sort of a publication of, the Veiled Prophet, it just, it's showing the Veiled Prophet and the beautiful young girl he's escorting and it's, you know, it's her coming out to society. And it just says, celebrating 139 years, the Veiled Prophet. And then underneath it, it says, a Ledoux News special promotion. All I can think Uh-oh. of is Reggie Ledoux? Is this Reggie Ledoux's <laughs> news outlet? Uh, <laughs> Me. I don't think so. But All right. All right. It's, Ledoux is the rich people suburb in St. Louis. It's like a mansion suburb that is strategically located on the western edge to avoid city taxes. All right, I think we I think we should uh, leave it there for today. Devin, I want to thank you so much for your time and for joining us and just sharing just but 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 a small glimpse at the the, the unique history of the state of Missouri. If you would like uh, more, uh, just, yeah, more 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 uh, more Devin, where should they go? Well, thank you guys for having me on. I really. It's it's my favorite thing to talk about. It's uh, the thing I'm most fixated on in the universe. Um, but I'm at, at Devin T. O'Shea on everything. I'm working with Eric Hain at Headwater Literary. We've got a proposal for a nonfiction Veiled Profit book out at Publishers. Uh, so we're hoping to hear some good news pretty soon, maybe late summer, early fall. So keep your ears out for that. Excellent. I will also just say, uh, as a note, uh, I have been enjoying putting together these states episodes. Uh, if you are out there with, um, good info on a local state journalist, uh, get in touch with me. Do not get in touch with Will or Felix. Your <laughs> uh, email will be sent immediately to the trash, but get in touch with me, uh, especially if it's for a state outside of, yes, as, as Will said, New York, California, Texas, or Florida. We've done those a lot. States I'm interested in Idaho, what the mm. hell's going on up there? Potatoes. Uh, Virginia, big state, but we don't really cover it at a state level, mostly for national stuff. Uh, Arizona, the Dakotas, North Carolina, places like that. If you have a good uh, lead on a local journalist you think would be a, a Chapo-friendly guest, get in touch with me and I will pick up recommendations. If you email me or Will, you will be doxxed. Mm. Yes. You will be <laughs> sent to our meanest group DM. <laughs> we will call your grandparents. Sure. You will be fired. Just, just you will never that, be the veiled prophet. <laughs> just, understand that if you e- if you email me, your IP will be traced and ops will be dispatched immediately <laughs> to your location. Yeah. Remember the uh, the raid scene from Belly mm. that happened to the Jamaican guy? That's going to happen to you. Dude, like the sexiest six foot four woman is going to roll up in your house covered in jewels and slit your throat. That's yes. what oh, no, fuck, I would that hate that. shit we're on. <laughs> I would hate I would hate that to happen to me I would personally. Hate that. If you email me I will send a courteous reply. <laughs>